I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Gospel of John, chapter 4 is where we're going to be this morning. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's okay. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1056 and you will find the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Uh, and by the way, if you don't have a Bible and you want to read the Bible, then please take one of these. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, it will change your life. Hey, while you're finding John chapter 4, let me tell you about an opportunity that I'm excited about that some of you might also be excited about. Uh, this coming November, November 2017, we're taking a trip to the Holy Land. We're going to go visit Israel and Jordan, and we're going to see the places that the Bible talks about. And for some of you, I know that uh, would be really interesting or desirable to go, and uh, so I wanted to share that with you. If that's something that you want to check out, then stop by the Connection Center in the main lobby after the service. We've got brochures there, and there's information in your bulletin about a meeting we're going to have in a couple of weeks on Saturday afternoon, right over here in the student wing, that, uh, that we're going to share information about the trip. So whether you uh, know you want to go or whether you're thinking about going, stop by and check that out so you can learn more about the Holy Land trip. really is an opportunity to bring the Bible to life. It is far more discipleship and learning oriented than uh, I anticipated the first time I went. So I'm excited to share that opportunity with you if that's something that you want to do. Hey, what on earth am I here for? That, that's the question that the Purpose Driven Life starts out with. And it's the focus of our series. So if you're taking this journey with us of the Purpose Driven Life, you're, you're reading the book, you're part of, participating in a life group, you're here, well, you are here, and, uh, and so you're doing this with us, and I'm excited about that. If you're just here kind of checking it out, you're not doing the Purpose Driven Life study with us, that's fine. Either way, I want you to know that our first purpose outlined in the Purpose Driven Life is worship. We were created to worship God. We were created to worship God. We were designed by God from the very beginning to know Him and to love Him and to worship Him. And just like everything else in this world, sin messed that up. Sin destroyed it, corrupted it, changed it. But deep down inside of every single person who walks this earth, there is an instinct, a desire, part of our DNA that is driven to worship God. Now, if we don't know God, we're going to find something else or someone else to worship. And, and you see that expressed throughout the world, and we see it in our culture. For instance, uh, you know, we start worshiping things that aren't God. Like, uh, how many of you have ever been to a concert? Right? Yeah. You've been to a rock concert? You know, and I know some of you are like, oh, I don't listen to that music anymore. Yeah, you do. You go to the reunion tours where the, you know, old rockers are playing songs from your youth. And you're like, hey, they got to take a break for oxygen between songs. And, uh, you know, like, yeah, they don't make music like this anymore. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I've been to those concerts, and there's a lot of stuff going on that looks like worship happening in that place. Or have you ever been around somebody, or maybe you are somebody that just absolutely freaks out when there's a celebrity around? It's like, oh, my goodness, did you see so-and-so's here? And, and, and everything changes because they're around a celebrity, and they got to go get their autograph, and they got to go get their picture taken with them, and, oh, wow, it's all changed. Or here, let me step on some toes. You know, there's some sports fans that kind of take it to a, a level that's a way unhealthy, right? I mean, there's fans, and then there's the fanatic crazies, and, and, and some people, you know, just get caught up in worship in those moments. By the way, you know, it's Super Bowl in three weeks, so make sure you wear your colors that day. You know, whatever team's... <laughs> You know, you're rooting for There'll be two teams that'll be really excited and everybody else will be disappointed. And, uh, and I'm going to wear my Cardinals red. We're not going to be playing in the Super Bowl, obviously. But, you know, hey. Oh, wait, what are we talking about? Worshiping the wrong things. And so, you know, people worship ideas. People worship creation. Pe people worship politics and politicians and power and money. People all around the world are actively engaged in worship because we were all created to worship God. Uh, Jesus tells us what this worship is intended to look like. Gospel of John, chapter 4. I'm just going to look at verses 23 and 24, but I encourage you to go home and read this whole chapter. It is an amazing story of life change about this Samaritan woman. Uh, Jews and Samaritans hated each other culturally for hundreds of years, and Jesus and his disciples are traveling through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem. 
and they, they stopped in this place, and Jesus struck up this conversation with a woman who was at the well drawing water, and, and it ended up being a life-changing conversation for her, but it kind of started out talking about worship and who's right, the Samaritans or the Jews, and, and here's what Jesus says about worship. Verse 23, Jesus says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then he tells us how he expects us to worship God. How he expects us to worship him. He, he says, I want you to worship me in spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit. In other words, it's got to be what happens on the inside more than what happens on the outside. Worship involves our inner being. It's not primarily our external actions that count, but it's the condition of our heart. That's why Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Think about that. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Three out of four of those are internal demonstrations of love. Internal. So God is focused on the heart. And so is our worship sincere? Is our worship passionate? Is our worship authentic? And by the way, nobody can see the condition of your heart but you and God. So that's a question that you've got to struggle with. Is your heart in it? Is, is, are you worshiping God in spirit and then truth? Worship isn't only about passion and excitement and feelings. It is rooted in truth. And how do we know the truth? Because, uh, you know, uh, our world is, is caught up in all this subjective understandings of truth. And people are like, I know my truth. And, and it's not your truth and his truth and their truth. It's not like you have competing truths. There is truth. So how do we know truth? If God wants us to worship him in truth, well, there are two biblically defined ways to know the truth. The first way is to know Jesus. To know Jesus. That, that's why we talk about having this life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, because if you know him, then you can know the truth. Because Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus said, I don't just tell you the truth, I embody the truth. And so if you want to know truth, then you have to know Jesus. And then the second way that we can know truth, and the, really the best way that we can know Jesus, is the Bible. Know the Bible. If you want to know truth, know the Bible. Jesus said this, John chapter 8. He said, if you remain in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth will do what? The truth will set you free. Now, everybody loves the truth will set you free. You hear people quote it all the time. They have no context for that. They just take half of that statement and go, yeah, the truth will set you free. What truth is that statement referring to? It's referring to Jesus' teachings, his word. Here at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. So everything that we teach, everything that we do is based on this book because this is how we know the truth. This is how we can worship God in spirit and in truth. This is why it's important to us that you read the Bible. This is why we give them away because if you don't have one, we want you to read it because we know it'll change your life. That's not just something we say. It's something that we believe and that we do. And everything that we do here at Calvary is evaluated by Scripture. It's informed by the truth of the Word of God. That's how I would know. If you showed up to me and said, Pastor Chad, I had a revelation. God appeared to me in a vision, and he told me what we're supposed to do. And I listen and go, uh-huh. And you say, well, he, he showed, told me in this dream that all of us are supposed to wear pink tutus to church, and the band is supposed to play Disney songs, and we're going to baptize people in Diet Pepsi. <laughs> and I would tell you then, that's not God. That's not God, because he's told us what he wants us to do in his word. And so we're going to evaluate the truth based on what scripture says, not just how you feel about something or some experience that you have. So we were created to worship God in spirit and in truth. So what is worship? 
What is worship? If you ask a lot of people, you get a lot of different answers what worship is. But if we were created to worship, and if we're going to live the life that God intends, if we're going to fulfill our purpose, we need to understand worship from God's perspective. So let's talk about what is worship. And since there's so many misconceptions about worship, let's start off with what worship is not. Here's just uh, things real briefly that worship is not. Worship is not attending a church service. Sorry for the confusion, because we advertise worship services Saturday at 5 o'clock, Sunday at 8, 9.30, and 11. And, and, uh, and I'm so glad you're here. I like the fact that you're here. You came in here to worship, at least most of you did. And so I appreciate that. But just showing up in church isn't worship any more than sleeping in your garage makes you a car. <laughs> See, just being there doesn't make it happen. Uh, it, we want to help it to happen, but... Uh, I'm glad you're here. I pray that you really will worship. So worship is not just attending a church service, and worship is not music. And I know some of you are kind of like, what are you talking about? It is worship. It's music. It's it's what it is. No, worship does not equal music. Music is something that God has given us to help us worship Him. Uh, It isn't, well, first we're going to worship, and then we're going to have teaching, and then we're going to worship some more. No, we use that kind of language in church, but that's not accurate. See, worship is the totality. And, and, and we praise God through uh, the music. We, we learn the truth through the teaching. It's all part of the worship. And music is a tool that God helps us to worship Him. But it isn't worship in itself. So if you sing a song of worship, we just sang, Lead Me to the Cross. If you sing the words, you sing the song, but you don't really mean it, is that worship? No, it's hypocrisy. You know, that'd be like, you know, you're you're someplace and and somebody you really don't like, it's their birthday, and you sing happy birthday to them, that's hypocrisy too, (laughs) right? If you have to grit your teeth to sing happy birthday or say it, then you don't really mean it, so don't say it. You know, and, and it's that way when we worship. If you don't mean the words, it's better not to sing. And by the way, you actually can worship God and not sing. I know some of you are like, oh, okay, good, because that's what I'm doing. If you're there, and and look, and and I I had to ask the forgiveness of the worship team, uh, but uh, look, some of you won't sing publicly or privately, period. You're just not going to do it. You're not going to open your mouth around anybody. You're not going to let words come out, even though they couldn't hear you because the band's loud enough. Um, Here's the thing. You're you're not going to do it, but if you're engaging with the words, if you're talking to God, you're having a conversation, you're praying, you're involved in that relationship with God in that point, that's worship. But if you're just standing there waiting for the music to get done so we can get to the preaching, that is not worship. So understand, music isn't worship. Attending a church service isn't worship. Religious rituals and actions are not worship. Now, baptism and communion can be awesome times of worship, or they can just be stuff you do at church. Uh, Your spirit decides whether or not it's worship. Your heart, your sincerity, your intent when you do that action. In other words, God's not looking on the externals and evaluating your life by the externals uh, of of how you worship. He's looking at your heart and your preparation and your love and your desire and your sincerity in that task. That's what he's looking at. God's not impressed with the rituals. He's impressed with a broken heart. And then worship is not only not attending a church service or music or religious rituals. Worship is not about you. It's not about you. Uh, I love that the first line in the book, chapter one, page one, line one, it's not about you. And worship isn't about you. It's not about your likes, your preferences, your music. Worship is about God. It's about his glory, his power, his majesty, his perfection, his grace. And by the way, we don't worship to get something from God. When we truly worship the living God, he blesses us incredibly. Okay, you're you're going to receive more than you ever give. But if you focus on what you're going to get out of worship, then it's not biblical worship. You really can't worship when you approach God with a self-centered heart. Um, So what is worship? What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? What does that look like? Let's talk about that. Worship is... 
First and foremost, worship is a relationship with Jesus. It's a relationship with Jesus. To know Jesus as your Savior. Not to know about Jesus, not to know the story and all that kind of stuff. That's good to know. But this is about experiencing His love and mercy personally. It's about a relationship, not a, a religion. It, and, and we deepen that relationship by spending time with God. Time spent in prayer, time spent in reading your Bible, time spent in worship gatherings, time spent serving God. Whether you are alone doing those things or doing them with a group of people doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that you're engaged in feeding that relationship you have with Jesus Christ. Because what happens to any relationship that you invest time in? If you, if you bathe that relationship in time, what's going to happen with that relationship? It's going to get better. It's going to grow. In other words, what's going to happen is you're going to grow closer together. Intimacy is going to happen. Understanding is going to happen. Love is going to grow. And that's worship. Worship is just living out the relationship we have with Jesus Christ every place we are, in everything that we do. It's the natural expression of that relationship with Jesus. That's why the Apostle Paul, he, he put it this way. He said, I want to know Christ. I want to know Jesus, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, being conformed to his death. It's almost like he was desperate. He said, I want to know Jesus. This is the guy who wrote half the New Testament saying that he wants to know Christ. He said, I want to know Jesus. I want to know him in his power. I want to know him in his pain. I want to know him in his obedience. I want to know all the aspects of Jesus. That's where worship begins, in our relationship with the living God. So do you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus? It's the most important question I'll ask you all day. Do you have that life-changing relationship with Jesus? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know that heaven is your destination? Do you know that your life is different because of Jesus? If not, don't leave here today without talking to someone. Asking, how can I begin that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Worship is relationship with Jesus. And worship is repentance. Repentance. When we enter God's presence, the closer we get to God, the brighter the light of His holiness and truth shines on us. And you know, and, and I know, the more you turn the light up, the clearer you can see not only what's around you, but yourself. And so as we enter into the presence of God, something happens that makes us uncomfortable. Because we step into the light and we become more and more aware of our brokenness, of our failure, of our rebellion, of the filth on our hands, uh, of the impurities in our heart, of the perversions in our mind. And, and in that moment of conviction, as we step into the light of Christ... We're going to do one of two things. We're either going to run and hide or we're going to repent. That, that's that's the, the choices within us. Now, a lot of times we run and hide because that's uncomfortable to be exposed, to be revealed for who we are before God. And, and, and we don't like that. And so a lot of times we'll run away from God. And a lot of us in this room have done that from time to time. And we try to hide from God, which you can't do, but... You know, we can deceive ourselves, we can cover up for ourselves. And, and by the way, some people run and hide and they get far away from God and the symbols of God and the people of God. And other people hide right in the midst in church. I've been to church, you've been to church where people are, are sitting there and, and they're broken and they're hurting, but they're covered up, they're hidden, they're trying to pretend that they've got it all together and that's just as wrong as running far away. You see, true worship means that we unflinchingly walk into the light of God, the holiness of God, the, the truth of God, and we confess that we are broken. We confess that we failed. We confess the filth on our hands and the impurities in our heart and the perversions in our mind. And we say, God, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. Because confession leads us to mercy. The Apostle John said this, if we confess our sins... God is faithful and God is righteous and God will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all the filth, all the unrighteousness, all the impurities in our life. That's an amazing promise. But if you want God's mercy in your life, the only way that you get there, the only path to that is repentance. So what is God challenging you to repent and confess 
today. So worship is a relationship with Jesus. It's repentance and it's sacrifice. Worship is sacrifice. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies, yourselves, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your, I love this, this is your reasonable act of worship. I, I mean, you gotta love Paul. Well, you don't have to. I do. The fact that he's crazy enough to actually suggest to us that our reasonable act of worship is to give our whole selves to God as a sacrifice. In other words, worship involves an offering. Giving something to God. Giving God your praise, your thanksgiving, your gratitude for his mercy and for his power in your life. Giving God your your financial resources because everything that you have he gave to you giving God your time and your talents because every breath you take is a, a gift from God all that you are and all the abilities you have are from him giving God your life to be used for his purpose you see the apostle Paul says our worship is giving ourselves to God can you identify the sacrifices that you've offered to Jesus so worship is a relationship with Jesus, it's repentance, it's sacrifice, and worship is surrender. To worship God is to surrender. Um, when we confess Jesus, we confess Jesus as what? Our Lord and our Savior. Okay, we know our Savior is that he saved us from our sins. Our Lord means that he's our King. He's the authority in our life. He's the one that is in control of our life. He's the one who's in charge of who we are. And, and, and we have surrendered our plans for his plans. We've surrendered our values for his values. We've surrendered our uh, hopes and dreams for God's hopes and dreams. All of that has taken place. That's what to call Jesus Lord means. Say, hey, your way is better than my way, and I'm going to follow you from here on out. I submit it's no longer my life, but I'm going to live for Jesus. That's what, again, the Apostle Paul said. One of my favorite verses, Galatians 2.20. Paul put it this way. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. What a beautiful statement. He said, look, I, I died to who I used to be, and now it's all about Jesus. And I surrender my life to him. I surrender my life to Jesus. And that means that we submit to God and we surrender control. And there is not one of us in this room that naturally wants to do that. This is the hard part about worship because we really don't want to surrender. That the sin nature in us is rebellious to the core and it does not want to yield control. And I know this because I have a grandson. Okay, he's, he's less than a year and a half, and he is a delight to me, and he, I'm one of his favorite people in the world, which I really like right now. I know that'll change. And, uh, and, and yet, uh, the moment that we want him to stop doing what he wants and do something else, this sweet, little, beautiful boy suddenly becomes possessed. You probably have the same experience with your grandchildren or your children. Suddenly the back gets arched really hard and sounds emanate from him that are not pleasant or joyful. And he does not want to conform. He does not want to submit. He does not want to surrender. And here's the crazy thing. At, at like 16 months, nobody has taught him that. It's sin nature. It's in us. We are naturally born rebels. And yet for worship, God says, I want you to surrender. I want you to trust me enough to surrender control and allow me to have control of your life because I am going to bless you and I'm going to do what's best for you in the same way that you want to do what's best for your grandson or for your child. I'm going to do what's best for you. Only, you know, you screw up a lot, but I don't. God perfectly wants to bless us and lead us to life and we're the ones who are arching our backs and we are rebelling against his control because we don't want to surrender and we have to decide 
that we're going to surrender. And you did this in the big picture when you confessed Jesus as your Lord. But the daily choice to surrender to him is a battle that every one of us in this room is going to fight. Surrender. Hey, what's the universal symbol for surrender? You know, hands up. Well, if you don't have a flag, I don't carry a flag with me. You guys have a flag in your pocket right now? Because I don't. If you do, I'm, I'm guessing it's like an American flag now, like a white flag. I told you we don't like to surrender. No, but we, you know, hey, I give up. I give up. You know, one of the cool things, and, and, and this is really hard for me to say because I was raised Baptist, and the only time we ever raised our hand was to ask a question in business meetings. Uh, <laughs> but there's a lot of you who, when you worship, you, you raise your hands. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it. I don't know what the intent of your heart is, but it's a beautiful picture of saying, God, I surrender to you. I give up. I'm not resisting. I'm yielding to you. You know who else does this? Children. Little children who want you to do what? Hold them. Hold them. Pick them up. They want to be close to us. They want to be held. They want to know that they're okay. They want to know that they're safe. They, they want you to take care of them. Isn't that a beautiful picture of us with God? We're as children, and, and sometimes you're just when you God, I give up, I need you. I want you to hold me. I want you to, to make me safe. I want you to lead me to life because I need you. So worship is just us saying, Father, I give up. I surrender. So today, are you worshiping God or are you attending a worship service? You're the only one who can decide that. You're the only one who can make it real, but I pray that you are stepping into your purpose of worship and you're surrendering to the King of Kings who loves you incredibly. Will you pray with me?